Good morning. Good to see you this morning. It's been uh, it's been a real blessing just to catch up with a lot of people. I just wish we had lots of time. We could sit face to face, one at a time. <laughs> so you can come up and visit us in Colorado. Uh, but space it out just a little and bring a snow shovel. So <laughs> where we live is at just over 9,000 feet in the mountains, and we've been watching the weather. We'll actually be traveling west of here for a while, so we're not planning on going home till Friday, and uh, it's looking like we're going to get another two or three feet of snow, maybe, which means I can't drive to my house anymore. <laughs> I get as close as I can and hike in, and then get a plow and plow down and hope I can get in after that, so... You got to love that kind of, I, I like that. How many of you like that kind of, I mean, that's appealing to you. How many of you thinking, what is wrong with you, Rocky? Yeah. I get it. Yep, I get it. But anyways, we were enjoying the ministry there, but really thrilled to be back and be able to see so many of you and have the opportunity to share God's word with you. Let me open this in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this day. And Lord, even as we've dealt with this theme over the weekend of the glorious hope that we have. I, I just, God, I pray that it'd be an encouragement. And I know there's folks that are in this room today that are facing some of those great challenges of life. And yet in the midst of those challenges, you are such a good God. And your provision is beyond even our greatest imagination. And I thank you for that. Lord, as we discuss what it means now to have our minds set on things above, but actually live on this earth, I pray, that, I pray that your truth would really come to bear on all of our hearts, on how that translates, how we ought to live, and what it looks like, uh, not just in a concept, but in a day-to-day, a -day, moment moment-by-moment reality. So I ask for your your guidance, I ask you to use your word as only you can for your glory, and I do thank you for your amazing love and the great provision you've made for us in Christ's name, amen. So my task is to talk about cultivating an eternal mindset, and uh, sometimes that's, that's misunderstood, and so I'm hopeful that, that in our time that we can get down to uh, rubber meets the road. So what does this look like? when I wake up in the morning, because truthfully, uh, if you have an eternal mindset, truly have an eternal mindset. When you wake up in the morning, your life will be vastly different than most people and even most people in the church, okay? So, I mean, I believe that. And I'm not saying every, I'm just saying it is such a dramatically different life that it is absolutely unrecognizable in this world as any kind of a normal. And so uh, I, I want you to know I'm passionate about the things I speak about, but if I get a little intense, just know I'm much worse when I speak to myself, okay? So take heart. You know, sometimes people think it's an eternal mindset when they say, I just want to go to heaven. But, you know, that can be, frankly, kind of similar to the, you know, have, have, maybe you've been in a class, don't answer this. I'll, I'll tell you when I'm really asking for your input, okay? <laughs> and I'll also tell you if it's a trick question before I do it. But, uh, but, you know, let's pretend this is a class. And I say, how many of you want to go to heaven? You can answer that. Go, oh, hands up. Okay, uh, Okay, no, no, that looked good, that looked good, okay, and then I say, just ask Jesus into your heart, follow me in this prayer. Now, you guys, who's not going to, I mean, there's always the obnoxious one, right? Uh, you know, my friends are going to be somewhere else, but most of us, yeah, I want to go to heaven, but that has nothing to do with the gospel, that has nothing to do with the gospel. The gospel is, you know what? You're an enemy of God. You are an enemy of God. You're in total opposite. He's God. You're ungodly. That's the picture in Scripture. That's the picture. 
God is holy. And you say, well, yeah, but if God is loving, can't he just accept us all? Well, but he's holy. Now, you could do that because you're so sinful. But God is holy, so you can't just have a relationship with something that's sinful. It's impossible. And so a holy God sent his perfect son to live a perfect life because he was the only one who could be a substitute for sinful people. It was the only way. And he did that so that you and I could have that privilege of repenting from our sins and turning to Christ as our Savior. That's a whole lot different than do you want to go to heaven. Okay? Now we're reconciled to God here on this earth. We have a relationship with the living God through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a whole different thing. So our wanting to go to heaven ought to reflect the biblical priorities related to our salvation. So have you ever heard somebody say, don't answer, have you ever heard people say, you know, this kind of thing. Um, I just want to go to heaven because I'm just, I'm just tired of this place. All about you, right? All about you. I just want to go to heaven because this, this virus thing. We don't hear about it as much as you do where we're at. We're kind of isolated, you know. I, I want to go to heaven because the politics today. Let's just have a talk about that. Eh, we're not going to do that. You know, it's like, so God's not in control anymore. I need to get out of here. It's like, really? You really think people are controlling all of this? God is is in control of everything today as he was before the virus, as he was before whatever president you want to choose. He's always been in control. So the idea of, I just, I'm tired of all this here, I want to go to heaven, is just another selfish pursuit. You know, it's like Christianity all about me, okay? And and maybe it's, I, I just want to go to heaven, I'm tired of the battle with sin. I get that, but it's still pretty focused on you. Or, I want to go to heaven because that's, I'm just ready to go because that's where the people I love most are. So I'm just ready to go. I just want to go. I, I, I mean, I get it. But it's wrong, wrong focus. And you guys, when we come to understand Christianity in its proper context of what is my life really like, supposed to be like today? What is it supposed to be like tomorrow? How, what is my perspective supposed to be? I, I think a lot of those selfish pursuits have to do with the fact that we're just not busy accomplishing all God has us here for. And so, frankly, it probably wouldn't make a whole lot of spiritual difference if you were here or gone. Which is awful. I'm not saying that's true. I'm just saying that's often the perspective of Christianity. It's kind of a Sunday to Sunday event. Our Christianity is defined by our go to church. But our our Christianity should be defined in much, much grander ways than that. And we're going to talk about some of those. So with that in mind, I know that's kind of a rough start, but it's going to be... um, It'll get nicer off and on. So my text is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 16. I mean, this, there are really precious truths that will, I hope will encourage your soul. It says in verse 13, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. I want to slow down because I would like you to think about these words a little bit, and we'll talk about them. Prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust, which were yours in your ignorance. But, like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, 
because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now let me just remind you that Peter is speaking to an audience that is in an extraordinarily difficult life circumstance. He speaks to the, the folks that have been scattered. And there's, there's persecution coming and growing. You know, so how would you like to have President Nero? Huh? That's, that's the time that he's writing. It is a complicated time for the believers. And I want to walk you through just real briefly, and these are sweet, encouraging things, truly. Because Peter kind of builds, and, and he reminds them of all they have in Christ. So if we were just to go back to verse 1, he first reminds them of their salvation. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and then he speaks to the people who are scattered through these various areas. He calls them the chosen, those who are chosen. God, in his grace, chose them to be his children. According to the foreknowledge of God, in eternity past, God has his plans of what he's going to accomplish. By the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood, may grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. I mean, you guys, I think this is so cool. I mean, you understand that for those of you who are Christians, when you came to faith, all three members of the Trinity were involved in your life. I mean, is that not incredible grace that God bestows on you, bestows on me. And then he, he starts by talking about our salvation. Then he talks about our hope. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You guys, it's not, that's not amazing. If you're in Christ, your inheritance is guaranteed. It's protected by the power of God. I was speaking to a group and I said, you know, listen, if you believe you can lose your salvation, you've already done it. You weren't saved because you were keep anything. God is the one who saves you. God is the one who protects you. And you guys, isn't that, praise God. Aren't you glad for that? I mean, because you know yourself and I know myself. Only God through his spirit and his word can protect us and preserve us till the day of Christ Jesus. And then he does mention some trials in the next verses. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed, and distressed is a, that's a heavy word. You've been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you've not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory obtaining is the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You know, when you look at this passage, it's amazing the times he, refer, he refers to the joy we have before the trials. He refers to the joy we have, joy inexpressible, that we have after the trials. And that helps us to understand as Christians how we should see trials. We'll talk about that just a bit. And then the next verses just speak of our privilege because it talks about related to our salvation. The prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and queries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted what? He predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to... What he's saying is, listen, what you enjoy, what you know, the, the truth that you have available to you, those are things that the prophets of old and the angels themselves long to know and to understand. And it is of significance that he speaks both. They wanted to know about the sufferings of Christ. They wanted to know about the glories that would follow. So we're going to go back to verse 13 and it says, therefore prepare your minds for action. In other words, in light of the fact that God has called you to be his child, in light of the fact that he assures you of a hope that, 
that can't be taken away. It assures you that the trials are intended in part for the sake of the purification of your faith. Uh, tells us the things we know, or I mean the angels and prophets of old would have loved to know more clearly. Then he says, therefore, prepare your minds for action, keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In this particular verse, there's really only one imperative, one command, and that's at the end of the verse. The imperative is fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so as you fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you, uh, it's because of that, fixing your hope on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In light of that focus, you prepare your minds for action and you keep sober in spirit, okay? But you've got to get the command uh, first. One, one commentator said, set your hope fully on the grace by preparing your minds for action and being sober. And so when we, when we talk about the hope that is yet to come, and he says fix your hope completely, keep in mind that when, when he uses the word hope, it's not like, uh, I hope I can get back up to my house when I get to Colorado. That, I mean, I think it'll probably happen eventually, but <laughs> you, there might be some challenge. You know, that's a, a maybe hope. I hope I get married someday. That's a maybe hope. I hope God will heal whomever. That's a maybe hope. I hope I can get a good job. I hope I can have children. I hope those are all maybe. This is not a maybe hope. When he says fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, he's talking about an absolute confidence and expectation, anticipation. The idea is I'm going to live in this life with the awareness that I, one day, and it could be today, I'm going to stand before the one that I love more than anybody. That's going to happen for those who are in Christ. And, and he's saying, fix, set your gaze upon that. Live in constant expectation and assurance that that day is going to come. I often use this illustration to help us try to think right about time. So, so I know we have a variety of ages here, and uh, appreciate seeing some that I can relate to easier. So some of us have to think harder about this. Some are maybe anticipating it, but do but you remember when, he, when you went into junior high school, middle school? It's like going to be two years. Mine was two years. Maybe yours was three. Two years. And there's a junior higher. It's like, I'll never get out. <laughs> I mean, I thought like that. It's like, two. I've got to be two years. And then you finish, and what happens? High school. <laughs> Double. Four years. And you guys, for a kid, looking at that, do you guys remember? Talk to somebody next to you. Maybe they do. But, but <laughs> it seemed like forever. Well, you guys, we understand how children do that. We are just as bad. Because we're at this stage of life, and sometimes, especially in the midst of the challenges and all that goes on, it's like, man, it just seems like forever. You guys, it's not forever. It's not. You don't have very much time. I don't care how old you are. You don't have very much time to get done what God has you here for. There is no time to waste. Because as you fix your hope on the revelation of Jesus Christ, I'm telling you, he's got a purpose for you in this life. He has a purpose for me. And we don't have time to waste. 
We just don't. And you know, that should be actually stimulating. That should be exciting. When he talks about the hope in verse 3 that we read earlier, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused to be born again to what? A living hope. I mean, you guys, this is, it's, it's beyond imagination. It's just beyond imagination. And, and many of you know, you know, my, my first wife is with Jesus. And uh, we were married 31 years. My precious wife, Pam, is taking care of me now. That's why I look okay. <laughs> but you guys, do you understand that her greatest day was my hardest day? Not bad day, hard, right? Because to stand there and my boys were there, and her parents who are here were there. And then we watched her die. But in a moment of time, you look and you say, Oh my word. She is with the Lord Jesus Christ right now. What could be better than that? As somebody once said, for people who believe in heaven, we work hard to stay here. But anyways... Uh, there's a reason. We need to be here to do the work that God has put. Relationships are important. But you understand, you guys, that hope is a glorious hope. It's a, anytime I see somebody who's in Christ who passes, I look at him and I say, I can't even imagine. In fact, I often will say, I mean, it would really be helpful if Sue could explain this lesson because she would do a much better job right now because she knows it in ways I don't. But I'm pretty sure she don't want to come back. You know what I mean? You understand what I'm saying? This hope is a living hope. It's a real hope. This is not I wonder. This is reality. And time is moving fast. And opportunities for ministry are going to diminish. And we're not going to be able to do the things that we can do right now. So, man, there's work to be done. And it should be, we should be so excited about the work that it should, it should be the primary focus of our life every moment of every day that we live on this earth. It's a precious hope, you guys, and it's a hope that's guaranteed. I think there are many Christians, or I should say professing Christians, only God knows, who uh, heaven is more about them than it is about God. And I'm telling you, if you know Christ in truth and you know the gospel in truth, it's all about God. And then how I can live in a manner that will glorify him here in anticipation of worshiping him there. That's what it's about. And so you've got to have a grasp on the true gospel. Now listen, when your hope is fixed, okay, you're living in anticipation of the one sure hope in this life, the living hope, then you go, okay, I've got to get my mind in the game. I've got, to be re I've got to be thinking right so that I make sure that my mind is set on what I'm supposed to be doing while I'm here on this earth. I need to be fully engaged in God's program. Now, we likely have some military folks here, but I just want you to think of this. If a person is in the reserves, military reserves, that means they're training, they're, you know, they're doing all the work, getting ready for if they ever have to go to war. There's a big difference between being in the reserves and being dropped in the, on the border of, say, Ukraine right now. We don't know what's going to happen. We need to be praying for that country and especially for the believers. I mean, can you imagine all of a sudden they put you on the plane and send you over? And they drop you out and say, now the reason you need to make sure that gun's clean and you know how to use it is if you don't, you will probably die. I mean, doesn't that, I mean, think about it. How would that affect you? I promise you, it'd affect me. That'd be pretty spooky. Your mind gets fully engaged. It's the real deal. Well, I think sometimes Christians live like they're in the reserves. <laughs> This isn't the reserves. This is not the reserves. This is the battle. Paul calls it the, the, the fight. 
This is the war, and it's the war for the souls of men. And you say, well, I don't feel it. Yeah, well, you're probably not in it. That's the reality. Every day, the opportunities to minister and make a difference in the lives of people. And so, how do you get ready for this war? Well, first of all, your hope truly has to be fixed on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's a gospel. You've got to know him. Repent and believe the gospel. But it is interesting. What's the greatest commandment? You can answer this one. You know, you notice when that happens, it usually tapers off and goes, and I kind of lose it. But that's right. Something like that. <laughs> You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Mind. You don't know how to prepare your minds for action? It begins with learning to love God as the greatest love of your life. Love Him supremely. Now, folks, truth is, you will never love God perfectly in this life. That will be a constant battle because there's always competing loves. But the greatest commandment is that we love God with an all-consuming and a supreme love. In Matthew 10, 37 and 38, it says, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not, these are, these are hard words, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, you guys, you have to understand, as our Lord gives us these words, we know he wants us to love other people. Why? What's the second greatest commandment? He, he is, we know, you know, love your wife. He, he tells us to love it. But you guys, what he's teaching us is that our love for God should be so great and be so superior to any love we have for another person. Our husband, our wife, our children. And the one that we, I think we struggle with more Self, a love for self. When you have competing loves in your heart, you cannot serve God as you should. You can't. See, that's why people say, <laughs> you know, I know I should be spending time in the Word, but I just don't have time. No, no, no. Say, I love other things better, but it's awkward to say. I don't want to evangelize, you know, I'm, I, I, I can't evangelize very good because, you know, I'm kind of a quiet person. No, 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 just say, I kind of love myself more than I love them or God. It's awkward, isn't it? It's awkward. But we need to be honest and say, listen, if I am not doing what God has told me to do, this is not an issue of, you know, but, you know, I'm, diff I'm, an, I'm an exception somehow. No, it's I don't want to do it because I love myself more. I mean, is that fair? I'm not saying it's not hard. I'm not saying that we don't struggle and fail. I'm saying when we just, you know, just kind of the way it is. I mean, can you imagine saying to God, the one who sent his own perfect son to die for us, that, I mean, I know you gave us your word, and I know you gave us your Holy Spirit to help us understand the word, but, you know, I, I mean, I was just awful busy down there. You know, there are a lot of pressures on me. Prepare your mind for action. Ephesians 6.14, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with the truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. You know, here's the reality. You know, someone, oh, how I love your law. If you have a supreme love for God, growing love for God, striving to love him as you should, you know the other thing you're going to love? You are going to love his word. You are going to love his word. I, I don't mean, I know I'm supposed to read. Yeah, come on, check that box you got today. You'll finish the year. It'll be okay. You can catch up a couple of yeah. You guys, the objective of spending time in the word is not to check the box off. 
The objective of spending time in the Word has to do with the fact that I have set my hope on the grace to be revealed at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I'm growing in my love because I want to have an all-consuming love for God and because I love Him and I know that He has entrusted me with the truth of His Word, I want to be a person that learns it, that understands it, that grows in it, that practices it. It's not just reading something in the morning and feeling like I've satisfied the read-through for the youth group or whatever it is. It's I'm reading it because I want to think Think about it all day long so that when opportunities come up, I am ready. When the temptations to sin come up, I have the scriptures in my mind. I'm constantly working on going over them and over them for my own spiritual benefit and then for the benefit of other people. In 1 Peter 2, 2, it's a great picture. Some of you in this stage of life where you have little babies, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect of salvation. It's like when a baby is hungry, even though they can't talk, are they able to communicate? In no uncertain terms. They don't need language. If they're healthy and they're hungry, you will know it because they want it. And they usually, you can explain to them, you know, you have to wait a few minutes. You won't do that more than once or twice. Like just get the food, get the food because that's their desire. Is that your desire? It is your desire that God has given me his wisdom and his word. I, I, I love it. You know, I mean, for me, I, I, I know that if God doesn't instruct me through his word, I have no wisdom worth anything for the day that I'm going to live. I just don't. I know that. I know if God doesn't instruct me in his word, there's no way I'm going to be alert to the opportunities he brings my way. I mean, if you're here in Christ... You need to love his word. You say, well, I don't. I just struggle with that. You need to go back to the gospel. Because if you understand the gospel and you're growing in your understanding of the gospel, what Jesus did for you, what he's doing for you, what he promises, I recommended to the, the, the first class, I was saying, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the, I am busy, I... I'll be honest, we're all busy. I, I'm so tired of hearing those words. I am busy. It's like, who cares? Everybody's busy for crying out loud. I mean, are you like the Lone Ranger? I mean, the truth is, you guys, you want to get serious about spiritual priorities? Don't just determine, well, I'll just get up 30 minutes earlier and try to give the Lord a little bit of time then. Don't do that. Sit down with your schedule. Write it all down. Everything you're doing. And then get rid of as much as you can so that you can spend quality, useful time so that you're spiritually prepared to, to accomplish what God has in store for you. And I used to hand out to people that I'd counsel and they, well, I really don't, Rock. I mean, I really don't have time. I'd give them a 24-hour day schedule, 30-minute sections. Fill this out for a week and bring it back to me. Everything you do, every 30 minutes, and you know, I, it's weird. It's like I almost never had to review them because they never brought them back. It was rare somebody brought one back, right? Because who wants to reveal how you use every 30 minutes of every day of your life? Well, I mean, it doesn't matter if I see it, right? I have my own struggles trying to be disciplined with my time. But God knows exactly how you're using your time. He knows exactly. And if you want it to be a priority, you're going to let go of things, even things that you enjoy. Because you're going to be committed more to God's word than you are about even the precious hobbies and things that are absorbing too much time and not allowing you to, to really be the student you need to. And you know, when we get down to the word of God, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. I mean, he's talking about not just reading 
he, he's talking about you, you need to learn it and have a handle on it and be growing in it. And you guys, as you do that, that's what prepares you for ministry. It prepares you for the work that God has. You know, chapter 4, verses 12 and 13 of Hebrews, it says, The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of jo both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Listen to this next verse. There's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. <laughs> you are totally exposed. Every priority, every interest, every minute of your day, God knows it all. And you guys, please understand, I don't mean that now you've got to go, oh man, I've got to do that. I'm saying that if you understand the gospel and truth, I'm saying, if you then set your mind on the things above and, and you're living in anticipation of the day you'll see your Lord and Master, I'm saying that you will love God and you will love His Word. It's not like, ooh, my, my accountability group person is going to check me. Your accountability person is God, <laughs> you know? And it's not supposed to be a burden, you know? In, in 1 John 5, it, it talks about our obedience. And you guys, keeping his commandments is a delight for the Christian. It's a delight. And, and so, you, you, as you love God, as you prepare your minds for action, you're in his word because you want to, to be prepared for the ministry opportunities he brings your way. And they're everywhere. They're ev it could be somebody sitting next to you right now. It could be when you leave here and, and you go to a restaurant that that waitress is having her worst day. And she needs to now hear, not your complaints because the food's late or whatever. She needs to hear the gospel. Or at the gas station or the store or in the neighborhood. And you guys, if we would all just be obedient in, in loving God and loving his word... I, I'm telling you, opportunities for ministry, evangelism, encouragement are everywhere. I mean, how many people do you run into a week? Probably quite a few. In your neighborhood, your school, there, pe I, people are everywhere. <laughs> They're everywhere. And if, if we were spiritually alert, it would change our prayer lives because we'd start talking about Pray for so and so. I shared the gospel with them. I pray for so and so. Uh, they're struggling and they need to have spiritual uh, guidance. You know, pray for the opportunity I'm going to have at work because I'm meeting with somebody. I know it's supposed to be for this, but I just wonder if they even understand the gospel. I mean, all of life is ministry. All of life. Prepare your minds. Get ready for the ministry. And then he says, keep sober in spirit. That is to be clear-headed. Be free from every form of mental and spiritual excess and confusion by being self-controlled. Schreiner says, there is a way of living that becomes dull to the reality of God, that is anesthetized by the attractions of the world. When people are lulled into such drowsiness, they lose sight of Christ's future revelation of himself and concentrate only on fulfilling their earthly desires. You know how this is. I, I mean, I think. I think we probably all do. How, uh, you know, you get through this conference. You go, man, that was a great conference. I'm tired. And then you wake up on Monday morning, and life goes on. Do, 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 you know, and you have your schedule for the day. You do the schedule. You get up Tuesday morning. You have your schedule. You do your schedule. You get up on Wednesday morning. Do your schedule. Oh, church Wednesday night. A little spiritual input. Then you come Thursday morning, and you, you go through your week. Back to Sunday. Here we are again. You guys, but truthfully, if you're thinking spiritually minded, even... When you get up out of this chair, you're going to start thinking, Lord, help me to be alert to the opportunities that our great God is going to bring into my path today. Those opportunities are on this campus. When you come to church, we used to teach our kids that, listen, when we go to church, pay attention. Look for somebody you can make a difference in your life. Sit by somebody. Talk to somebody. Encourage. But don't go to church just going, here I am, Tom. You know, pour it in. 
You're going to minister. And, and again, it's not, you guys, it's, your ministry is, is not just in a, a class. It's, it's important to understand. Your ministry is a life. And so if you work in a ministry, that's great. When you're done with that ministry, whatever it is, you know, you, children's Sunday school, when you're done with it and you leave the class, you didn't finish your ministry. That's just an element of your ministry. Your ministry is all, your whole life. So when you leave that class and you start walking across this campus and you run into somebody and they're having a hard time, you stop and minister to them. When you get in the sanctuary and you sit down, you're not there just to receive the ministry. You're looking around and you're praying, God, if somebody sits next to me, maybe they're not a Christian, maybe they are a Christian going through. You're always looking for ministry. Always. And then when you leave and, and, and you get in your car to go somewhere else, you're thinking about ministry. When you drive down the road and you see an accident, you think, I, I can't be a, I'm not going to be able to stop and do anything. But you pray that the tragedy or difficulty in somebody's life will lead them to Jesus. Or if they're Christians, that there'll be a testimony through whatever crisis they're facing. And you do that here. You think of your, your, your brothers and sisters in Ukraine, wherever it might be, you guys. I'm just saying, all of life is ministry. It's, it's ministry. And, and when he says, keep sober in spirit, it's, it's don't, don't be distracted. Don't, don't become cloudy in your mind and forget. And, and uh, for those that were here first hour, I'm going to say this again, that you guys, circumstances. Are your circumstances divinely ori oriented or or given to you? Does, is God in control of your circumstances? You can respond. Okay, now I want you to respond better. Is God, is God divinely in control of your circumstances? You know why you have circumstances in life, right? It's because it's the circumstances of life that provide opportunities for ministry. You think God's just bringing your life to intersect with somebody else's just because? Circumstances provide opportunity. Keeping sober in spirit, keeping clear-headed, not being distracted, means that you realize whatever God brings into your life has a great potential to be a ministry opportunity. And so when you bump into that person you haven't met to, uh, in a long time, it's a ministry opportunity. When somebody says, uh, uh, I'm going to sue you. You're going to have lots of ministry opportunities you never thought you would have because you're going to meet people that you didn't want to meet. When you lose your job and you've got to go to interview after interview after interview, if the only reason you go is to interview, you could become immensely discouraged. But if you realize that, you know what, if God wants me to go to 20 interviews because that many people need to hear about Jesus, those are ministry opportunities. You get that difficult diagnosis that says, you know what? You got big problems physically. This is going to be rough. You can be all consumed with you and your circumstance, not to diminish the complexity of that, but you must not lose sight of the ministry opportunities. They're everywhere. You're in the hospital. I tell people, I, I visited somebody here while I was here that's in a difficult situation in a care center. And I always remind people, as long as they have cognitive ability, that as hard as that is, this is, the fact that you're moving down that road toward death, the people who walk into this room to see you are likely in far worse condition than you are because probably most of them are unsaved. How great in your dying days to share the gospel with people, knowing that God has you there for a reason, and it's not just so you can die. It's so in that process, you can make a difference in somebody else's life. And if they're not able to talk anymore, then their circumstance becomes your circumstance because you know them and you love them. And now they may not be able to do it, but you do it on their behalf because you go to see them and you recognize the opportunities of the other people there. I'm telling you, folks, we get so consumed with how circumstances affect us, we forget that God is intentional. 
And if I'm sober-minded, if I'm thinking right, if my mind's prepared for action, I'm going to recognize my tears, my difficulty, my heartache, my difficulties will most certainly provide opportunities for ministry. And I need to be alert and aware. I mean, that's why the Apostle Paul, you know, when he's in jail in Philippians, don't you think it's kind of amazing that while he's in jail, he's saying, my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel? I mean, it would have been real easy to say, God, really? I mean, I'm out there starting churches, I'm traveling all over, and now, he doesn't do that at all. I actually think it's quite humorous that he doesn't even call himself a prisoner of Rome or a prisoner of the Jewish leader, you know, the the guys that put him there. He won't even give them credit for putting him in jail. He, what does he say? I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Isn't that great? We give people way too much credit for the circumstances in our life. Even if evil people do evil things to you, God has not lost control. Don't give them credit. Just fulfill the ministry that God's going to accomplish through you in the midst of the difficulty. It's a good thing. So anyways, moving on. And uh, as it continues, it says uh, that, as in verse 14, it says, As obedient children do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. Now, I'm going to just talk a little bit here because I want to talk more about the next point. But you guys, you've seen a child who's not compliant, Right? Okay, maybe it's yours, okay? I mean, ours never had problems. <laughs> you owe me, Curtis. <laughs> okay, well, there's that one time. But anyways, uh, we know what it looks like when a child's compliant and when they're not, right? And we know when they're com- compliant with a plan. You know how a kid can just absolutely be a pain and it's like, Really? You know, and, and the discipline just goes on and on. And on. and then they're all of a sudden super sweet. And you go, <laughs> something's going on. And then, I was wondering. My friends, are, and it's like, I believe I'm being set up. Okay. <laughs> We can be just like that with God. You know, our life is supposed to be consumed with serving God. Not just, you know, read the Bible hoping God will give me what I want. Okay? Kind of ignoring God and the day-to-day life ministry that we're supposed to have, but then all of a sudden, a hard time, oh God, you know, all of a sudden you start praying. Because the Christian life, the obedient Christian is the one who desires to obey. That's in 1 Peter uh, 1 when it says, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for sincere love of the brother. 1 John 5, 3, this is the love of God. We keep his commandments. His commandments are not a burden. We're, We're not obeying God to try to manipulate God or control God or get our way. We're obeying God because his ways are right. And the principle I used to teach the youth group all the time is, uh, listen, as you walk through life, if there, you come to a point where you disagree with God, the solution is very simple. God is always, you are always, isn't that great? I mean, God made it so simple that we can grasp that truth, right? God is always right. His ways are always right. It's not about understanding my circumstances. It's about knowing who God is and what God's like. That's what orients me to life. You guys, if you think you have to know about the circumstances, you're kidding me. You don't even have a big enough mind to comprehend them, so get over it. Really. There's no, you guys, God's plan is so vast and so grand, I don't think any of us would possibly have the capacity to comprehend it. But he is good, and he is right, and he is trustworthy, and it's good. And we want to obey him because we love him. It's, it's, it's not a forced obedience. It's a blessed obedience. We are children of the living God. It's glorious. So as obedient children, don't be conformed to the former lusts which were yours and your ignorance. Romans 12, 2, don't be conformed to the world. In 1 Peter 4, 2, it talks about don't live the rest of your life for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. And you guys, I I just want to address this in this way. So in counseling, 
I've found that oftentimes when people come in to meet with me, there are issues in their life, there are sinful issues, sinful patterns, whatever it is, and when they come in, they want me to help them to get victory over the sinful patterns, but they don't want to do the next step. You guys, the reason we put off the deeds of the flesh is why? So we can live in the righteousness of God, so we can put on the fruit of the Spirit, so we engage in ministry, in life, and not a ministry, in a life of ministry. Do you understand that? So people who come in and all they want is me to help them get over this sin or whatever, sin or whoever they know, whatever it is, if they're not willing to move from there to, then I also want to follow the next command. I'm telling you, they're going back and they're going back and they're going back. Christianity is not putting off the deeds of the flesh. Christianity is when you're redeemed, your heart is changed, you put off the deeds of the flesh and you pursue righteousness. I think that there are a lot of people who profess Christ. They do one, and they're unwilling to do the other. And I'm telling you, that's not the reflection of biblical Christianity. You put off one in order to do the other. And unless you think, I I mean, this is a serious thing. Look at, at verse 15. He says, like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in what? All your behavior. Okay, think of that. Be holy in all your behavior. In 1 John 2, 6, the one who says he abides in Christ ought himself to walk how? In the same manner that Jesus walked in. Christianity is not putting off. It's putting off and putting on. It's fleeing and pursuing. And if you try to do one only, you will never, ever live as an obedient Christian. And I would even question whether you even understand the, the truth and the power of the gospel. And <laughs> sometimes I'll talk to somebody and they say, well, I, I just can't memorize scripture anymore. And, and I, I get it because I'm getting a little older, but, but I, I still can memorize. But some people would have a harder time and, and some people have challenges just with learning, period. And so I'll tell them, okay, I have only one verse I want you to memorize. And you really, if you, if you can just do a part of the verse, okay, let's just do that. And if you would just meditate this in, on this one for maybe the rest of your life. First, or Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. It says, therefore, be imitators of God as his beloved children. Be imitators of God. Again, we're not talking a moment in time. We're talking lifestyle. We're talking when you wake up in the morning, you say, God, this is what I have on my schedule, but I know I don't know all that you have on my schedule. God, I know I have these business meetings, but I know those meetings may be gospel meetings. God, I don't know what things may interrupt my day, but I know that you have plans. God, please help me to be alert. And not only alert, God, but I struggle sometimes with, yeah, I see it, but I don't respond immediately and, and communicate the truth that I can. Give me the courage to be alert to that. And you say, wow, I failed. What? Okay, so it doesn't help if you fail and you get totally consumed with the fact that you fail. And, and so then the way to avoid failing is just not do it anymore. That's like failing all the time, Right? It's not that we don't struggle. It's that when we struggle and go, God, help me to be more alert, and then we do it, and then we learn to do it. We learn to recognize him, and we're busy because we want to be imitators of God. He said, be holy as God is holy. Verse 16, he says, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And you guys, again, our, our objective is to become more like Christ. It's not attainment in this life, but it's a passionate pursuit, knowing that our Lord so kindly reminded us through Paul that the work that God has begun in your life as a believer, he will carry it on to completion. He will carry it. You know, we're reminded that we're supposed to work hard, living out our faith in Philippians 2, but then it says, for, for it's God who is a work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So it's really not by your strength, it's by God's strength, by God's wisdom, for God's purposes, for God's glory. Matthew 5, 48, therefore, 
You are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. When you get down to it, the Christian life comes down to understanding the true gospel. And you know that many people don't. And let me just remind you, if you ask somebody, you're talking to somebody about the gospel, and they say, no, I'm a Christian, it's probably not good to stop there. Because like most of our country says, I'm a Christian. I'm fairly certain that isn't true. And, you know, so you ask them, well, what does it mean that you're a Christian? Help me to understand that. And they share, and you're going, awkward. Now what do I say? Well, you guys, you lovingly tell them the truth. Gently, lovingly. Let me share how I came to Christ. Let me share what God showed me in this word. You, you share the truth, because wouldn't it be awful? To, are you a Christian? Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, you'd be amazed how many people do that. You guys, most people don't understand the gospel. And will there be awkward times? Yeah. But you guys, awkward's not bad. It's just awkward. And so don't stop. Don't, don't decide not to share when it's clearly a problem. I mean, that person's going to think the rest of their life they're going to be with Christ one day. And they don't even know the gospel, but they think they do. You know, the Lord was so good about that. If you want to look at his example in life, you guys, he was constantly engaging people with the gospel, constantly addressing the issues. And I, I just want you to know that the Christian life, it's, it's, uh, well, it's so dynamic. It can be hard. You know, just, suffering must be a part of our lives. You know that. The scriptures are absolutely clear. Suffering must be a part of our life. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy 2, the last letter that he wrote before he died, he said, I am willing to endure anything for the sake of those who are chosen that they also may come to eternal life. He's willing to endure anything? You going to jump on that wagon? You need to. You need to. When God brings those difficult, don't say, oh, wait, how come? No. Ministry is coming. Hang on. God, you can sustain me and help me to fulfill your purposes. Because that's, that's biblical Christianity. Uh, it's not reading your Bible and going on with your normal day. It's you, you spend time in the Word so you can think about God's Word all day so that you don't miss opportunities. And for those that struggle with sin, that's who? Oh, that's all of us. As you're learning to think like that, that provides the resource for victory in the Christian life. You know, how can a young man keep his word or avoid sin? It's by keeping it according to God's word. It's, it's meditating on God's word. It's a victory that God provides to us. And so that is the Christian life. And if your life is not that, I'm just telling you, that is not what God designed. He's very clear about it. In the last class, it was preparing for death and finishing well. And I said, so here's a simple phrase. I'm going to close on this so you can get out of the parking lot while it's safe. <laughs> Die now, and you will live right for when you die again. You know what I mean? Die to yourself, and you will live as you should, and you'll be ready when God takes you home, when you die again. But you've got to die now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thanks for the thanks for the provision you make for us. And God, we know not one of us deserve it. Not one of us. You're such a kind God. You paid such an immense price. Lord, I just pray. We all struggle in this life. Sin is a battle for sure. But God, I pray that you would just constantly remind us of who we are in Christ, of the, the living hope, how to fix our eyes on that grace to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we focus, then help us to prepare our minds for action, to be sober in spirit. Help us to put off the deeds of the flesh. And God, help us to learn to walk as you would walk reflecting your holiness, not perfectly, but, be, but desiring to live in such a way that you would be pleased, that people would see our lives and recognize we are so different, that they would hear our words and hear the truth of the gospel. 
Lord, that we would recognize that all of life is ministry, not just a little bit. And Lord, when we struggle, just remind us of these truths. When we face the difficulties of life, God, help us to think quickly that you are divine and you're preparing us for ministry and then help us to be alert to the opportunities to accomplish your purposes. And Lord, again, I, I am so immensely grateful that you're patient with us, that you continue to work in our lives, you continue to prepare us for glory for which we long for. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.